Welcome back. Now we meet one of the most enigmatic figures in the novel, the famous Ginés de Pasamonte, who will appear in several future episodes. The first thing we notice is the importance Cervantes attaches to this character. He describes him as very good looking, about 30 years old, except that he's slightly cross-eyed. Also, he comes bound differently from the rest, with chains everywhere, making him into a symbolic figure, perhaps some sort of projection of the spirit of our crazy Hidalgo. He even seems to be a kind of scapegoat, expiating the sins of the other criminals, because one of the guards says that he alone had committed more crimes than all the others combined, and that he was so daring and such a remarkable villain that although they escorted him like that, they did not feel safe in his presence and feared he would surely escape. Ginés de Pasamonte has been the subject of fervent debates among Cervantes specialists, also called Cervantistas. The novel's most chained figure seems to be a jab at a real historical character, Jerónimo de Pasamonte, a rival of Cervantes who wrote an autobiographical account in which he boasted of his exploits at the Battle of Lepanto against the Turks in 1571. Some critics even believe that Pasamonte authored the apocryphal continuation of Don Quixote published in 1614 under the pseudonym of Alfonso Fernández de Avellaneda. Now, Cervantes was also at Lepanto, where he lost the use of his left arm, and he was apparently offended, first by Pasamonte's inflated account of his heroism, and later by his spurious continuation of Don Quixote. But rather than reduce the origins of the modern novel to a rivalry between two veterans of Lepanto, let's consider Ginés de Pasamonte as a complex and important figure in his own right. Above all, we must recognize that Pasamonte is the novel's most representative example of the pícaro, a liminal character somewhere between a thief and a beggar who can be defined as an anti-heroic protagonist of a certain genre of autobiographical narratives already typical of Spanish literature in the late 16th century. Without going into too much detail, just remember that the modern romanticized figure of the anti-hero has become commonplace in television series like Breaking Bad or films like Match Point. Now, the officer responsible for transporting the convicts confirms that Pasamonte has written the story of his life and that he left the book in jail pawned for 200 reales. When Don Quixote is shocked by this value, is it that good, he says? Pasamonte expressly cites the first example of the picaresque novel. It is so good that it's bad news for Lazarillo de Tormes and all the other books of that genre that have ever been or will be written. During this section of the novel, Cervantes clearly had in mind the themes and techniques of the picaresque. An obvious question arises, what moral, social, or literary value did this type of novel have for Cervantes? All Cervantistas think we know, but it's doubtful that this issue will be resolved anytime soon. Next comes an interesting joke about the pícaro. When Don Quixote asks if he has finished his book entitled The Life of Ginés de Pasamonte, the galley slave author responds, ironically, how can I be finished if my life hasn't finished? This might also be another of Cervantes' many autobiographical gestures. Like Pasamontes, Cervantes was a generic innovator. Likewise, he was a maritime soldier, and he was a prisoner several times, both in Algiers and Spain. Also suggestive, Pasamonte is already familiar with life in the galleys. I know what hardtack tastes like, and I have felt the whip. And when he says that under such circumstances, he has had to compose his book by memory, I know it by heart, he says, this just might be a clue regarding Cervantes' own method. Even more interesting is the anti-authoritarian turn that the novel takes at this very moment. Pasamonte irreverently claims that he has already been in the galleys. To serve God and the king, I've already rode four years. And when the officer calls him a scoundrel, bellaco, he responds with an oddly formal, even legalistic expression of anger, insinuating that the officer has himself behaved in some criminal manner. Those gentlemen did not give you that staff so that you could mistreat us poor wretches here in chains, but rather 
to guide us and deliver us to where his majesty commands. If not, by the life of enough, just be advised that one day those dark stains, manchas, at the inn might come out into the light. We never find out what Pasamonte is talking about. Which stains could these be? And at which end did they occur? As far as readers are concerned, the characters most guilty of behaving unlawfully at inns are precisely Don Quixote and Sancho Panza. As for stains, well, Don Quixote is literally of the stain, de la mancha. To continue, the officer raised his stick high to strike Pasamonte, and suddenly Don Quixote launches into a defense of the poor victims of misapplied justice. Not only does he suggest that there has been some twisted ruling by a judge, and that both torture and corruption have influenced the prisoner's trials, Don Quixote eventually appeals to transcendental morality. I find it cruel and unusual to make slaves out of men whom God and nature made free. The officer rejects this criticism and even insults Don Quixote, transforming the helmet of Mambrino not back into a barber's basin, Bathia, but into a chamber pot, Bathin. Be off with you, sir, and good luck on the road ahead, and straighten out that bedpan on your head, and don't go about sticking your nose where it is not wanted. That does it. Don Quixote now charges the officer, and before long, the galley slaves are free and the guards have run away. The narrator tells us it is Sancho who understands what this means. Those who fled were now obligated to notify the Holy Brotherhood, which would sound the alarm and come looking for the criminals. Therefore, the squire begs his master to hide in the nearby Sierra. Incarnating the sabotage that has just been done to formal justice is the commissary officer whom the escaped slaves have left stripped and naked. But, as is his custom, Don Quixote now insists that the freed slaves go to El Toboso, appear before Dulcinea, and tell her all the details of the adventure. Pasamonte will not consent to this, and thinking like Sancho, he says that they have to split up, each man for himself, trying to burrow into the bowels of the earth so as not to be found by the Holy Brotherhood. Pasamonte makes an interesting biblical allusion here to the exodus of the Jews from Egypt. Interesting, because we are about to enter the Sierra Morena, a mountain range which separates the Christian world of La Mancha from the Moorish Andalusia, and also because Pasamonte expressly associates Egypt with El Toboso and not Córdoba or Granada or Sevilla. The episode ends when the slaves shower stones on our heroes, leaving them thrashed and on the ground again. A fascinating detail here is that one of the convicts, the student of Latin, went at Don Quixote and took the basin from his head and gave him three or four blows with it about his shoulders and smashed it as many times on the ground until he shattered it. So there you have the helmet of Mambrino, kaput, finished, done for, smashed to pieces. By contrast, the final description of Sancho's ass echoes the beautiful contemplative mysticism at the end of St. John of the Cross's spiritual canticle. With its head bowed, pensive, now and again twitching its ears, thinking that the storm of stones had not yet passed and must still be falling around him. To summarize, the final episode before entering the Sierra Morena, within which will take place the rest of the novel, is characterized by anti-authoritarian touches, a tone that is critical of the judicial system of Spain around 1600, a series of energetic references to the picaresque genre, and more ethnic and cultural allusions, which continue to stress the problematic identity of our hero. Fidia Mete Berengeli is the Arabic and Manchegan author El Toboso is referred to as Egypt, and perhaps more than anything else, Cervantes probes the deep moral contradictions that underwrite the maritime warfare conducted by the Habsburgs against Islam in the Mediterranean Sea. In fact, thanks to the liberation of the galley slaves, Don Quixote and Sancho are now essentially rebels fleeing the law of His Majesty the King. But we must be careful 
the mere fact that Don Quixote, and perhaps even Cervantes himself, believed that we should not condemn this group of criminals in chains to the galleys, does not necessarily mean that our author, always proud of his role at the Battle of Lepanto, was in disagreement with the fundamental struggle against Islam, especially the Turks. The only thing we know for sure is that the irony of Cervantes takes no prisoners.